Okay, so I know I literally just said I was gonna take a break from messing with Pokemon Stadium, but I just couldn't wait to start on this idea. So far we've messed around a bit with the Game Shark to fix bugs in Pokemon Stadium, but I think there's some untapped potential here. Specifically, I want to use the Game Shark to edit the Pokemon on my copy of Pokemon Blue. Now, obviously this cartridge can't plug into this cartridge, but we won't need it to. Since Pokemon Stadium loads up saves from Game Boy games through the transfer pack, we should be able to find where it loads our party data with a little bit of reverse engineering. After that, we should be able to write Game Shark codes that can change these party members to improve their stats, change their species, or even just their name. Now, although Project 64 doesn't have the best reputation, I'm actually going to use it for this project. For the purposes of this video, its Game Shark cheat emulation and memory dumping feature is exactly what we need. But I think we can all agree that the pop-up window that blocks usage of the emulator every few times you open it is super annoying, so I'm going to get rid of it. Using Ghidra, a reverse engineering toolkit developed by the NSA, we can compare the decompiled assembly of the Project 64 binary to the publicly available source code of Project 64, and find the line that shows the pop-up window. This line is simply a method call on a class that shows the pop-up window, so by changing the first line of that method to immediately return, we can skip all the code that would, you know, show it. I probably could have just compiled my own version of Project 64 from the source, but I'm honestly too lazy to set up a Windows development environment on a different computer, and this is way funnier to me. This is the party we're going to be working with for the analysis and reverse engineering portion of this video. I gave them all single character names that should make them really easy to find in memory. I dumped the RAM of Pokemon Stadium while we had this party loaded up in the Pokemon Lab, which I think gives us the best chance of finding something. Opening this file in a hex editor and searching for one of our Pokemon names quickly reveals a sequence of bytes that appears to contain six Pokemon entries. It can be kind of intimidating just to see a big brick of numbers to decipher, especially when you haven't done much reverse engineering before, but there's a couple things that immediately stuck out to me. Obviously the trainer name and the Pokemon name, but there's this other big string of bytes that's the same between all the entries. And it turns out this is also the trainer name. I'm not sure why they chose to store the trainer name in two different formats, but it points to there potentially being data in here that we might not expect. A lot of the other bytes I was able to identify simply by taking the numbers on this screen, converting them to hexadecimal, and trying to find them in each entry. Less straightforward are the bytes representing the species of the Pokemon and its moves. I had a hunch that the species and moves were probably stored similarly to how they were stored in Pokemon Red, which I know a bit more about since I've started making videos about these early Pokemon games. Converting the species and moves of each Pokemon into their respective IDs that I grabbed from Pokemon Red, uh, it reveals their location pretty quickly in the RAM dump. At this point, the data structure was starting to look really similar to the data structure actually used in the Gen 1 save files. So following that specification, I was able to determine the rest of the fields, since it turns out that the two formats are incredibly similar, minus the trainer names, Pokemon names, and the species IDs, which are stored separately in the Gen 1 games. Now for this whole project idea to work, we need to know if this is actually the region of memory being used here to display Pokemon, and if that's the case, we need to know if making changes to this region with Game Shark codes will persist back when we save in the lab. Now I talked about them a bit more last video, but we're only going to be using two different types of Game Shark codes for this project the 8-bit constant write and the 16-bit constant write, each of which is just a simple instruction telling the Game Shark to write this value to this location as often as it possibly can. Let's start with a code that changes something simple, just the species of our first Pokemon. We know that the species ID and Pokedex ID for Pokemon Zero are at these locations and our 8-bit values, so let's construct two different Game Shark codes to write Mewtwo's values to these locations instead. In Project 64, one of the main features I want to take advantage of is the GameShark emulation feature. We can simply add the codes we've created as a new cheat and load up a ROM of Pokemon Stadium 1.0, and it should basically be as if we're using a GameShark with Pokemon Stadium IRL. It isn't, for reasons that we'll see later, but we can ignore that for now. So did it work? Well, our first Pokemon has been changed into a Mewtwo, and when we open the save file on a Game Boy emulator, we see that the change does actually persist. It does look like this idea will work, but I want to try it out on the real thing to really know, and I want to see just how much we can get away with. Now, one issue with the Game Shark is just how annoying it can be to enter in long strings of codes. For any property of our Pokemon we want to change, it's going to be at least one or two strings of 12 characters, and for the names, it could be up to five. It would be nice if we could just automate this process and be able to just dump codes directly onto the Game Shark without having to enter it ourselves. So I built this. This is an Arduino powered N64 controller. It accepts commands from a computer and converts them into the joypad protocol to emulate button presses on a real console. With the help of some custom software, it takes a list of GameShark codes and converts them into button presses it relays to the console. 
handling things like creating new codes with custom names, and we can even use it to do things like purge all the current codes automatically. While not very fast, since it still has to do all the button presses we'd have to do, it does enable us to work on other things while we're waiting for codes to get uploaded. Now, if you aren't interested in how it works, feel free to skip ahead to this timecode. Otherwise, I'm gonna nerd out quite a bit about the details. The Nintendo 64 controller protocol is already pretty well researched, and people smarter than me have figured out how to emulate one using cheap microcontrollers like the Arduino Nano. I wasn't gonna take this approach at first since I didn't know about this fantastic library, but after spending a day trying to troubleshoot the cobbled together attempt I made by literally just hooking up digital pins to test pads on a half-busted controller, I relented and actually did some research. While it does seem pretty simple, there are a couple of issues with this setup. First is that there's no feedback mechanism for the controller to know if an input it issues actually has had the desired effect. For example, the GameStrike has some really slow menus, so if you fire button presses too quickly, one might get eaten during a menu transition. Without spending a month developing a custom computer vision solution, we sort of just have to rely on setting the delay high enough between presses that no inputs ever get eaten. But it's obvious from watching the nano issue commands that there are some things that we can improve. GameShark has a feature to make entering large lists of codes easier. When entering multiple codes in a cheat, the previous code you entered can get copied into the next line. With the trigger buttons, you can then just move your cursor to the characters that need to be changed and enter new values. What my first algorithm was doing was entering in every character of the code even if some of those characters just got copied over from the previous code. We can update our algorithm to remember what the last code it entered was and issue commands like I said earlier, just updating the ones that need to be updated. Let's think about the worst case scenario for this algorithm. If we have a sequence of codes like this, this essentially regresses to the worst case scenario again, since compared to the last code, almost all the characters are changing. However, if we just took this exact same list and reordered it, there's only a few changes from one line to the next. So what we need to do is actually first sort the codes as to minimize the changes between each entry. Since I dropped out of my CS degree, I'm only somewhat qualified to solve this problem, but it turns out that going with the most small-brained solution possible works perfectly fine, especially when you only need to sort under a thousand elements. Okay, so this is how the algorithm works. We start with two lists. One is the list of input codes that we need to sort, and the other is an empty list that we will slowly be adding results to. We start by moving the first code in the input list to the output list, and then we search through the rest of the input list to find a code that would require the least number of changes to make it equal. We then move that code to the output list and repeat this process over and over and over until there are no remaining items in the input list. I'm not gonna prove that this even results in the most optimal ordering of codes, but comparing performance times between sorting, no sorting, and the naive algorithm shows a pretty noticeable increase in speed. As for hardware issues, for some reason, I had to lower the baud rate of the Nano to 300. Otherwise, it would drop like half the characters in the commands I was sending. There's probably something really dumb going on here that I just didn't care enough to investigate, but if you have any ideas, feel free to let me know below. And for those of you who use the time code to skip the last section, welcome back. Now that we have a way of uploading large amounts of codes reasonably quickly, Let's go ham and try a bunch of different codes out. After waiting a bit, we've got a set of cheats that should change our first Pokemon to have maxed out stats, some different moves, into higher level. However, real consoles often bring challenges you would have never seen in an emulator, and we see that only some of the codes seem to have worked. Some values updated, like the level and moves, but it seems like almost nothing else changed. What gives? Did we have a dropped input somewhere that resulted in a bad code? Carefully checking the list shows that it actually worked perfectly fine. So were my codes just wrong in the first place? Simulating them in Project 64 says no, it does everything we expected it to do. At this point, I was worried the whole video was gonna end in failing to do what I set out to do, but I'm pretty sure we can salvage something. I think this probably has to do with some sort of race condition, where when you have a lot of codes enabled at once, some of the codes don't have enough time to execute before Pokemon Stadium either copies this data somewhere else in a different format, or makes this section read-only, or some other weird subtle effect that I don't quite understand. Regardless, I was able to confirm that using multiple smaller cheats enabled could still modify Pokemon, but if you have too many enabled at once, they will start failing. So while this technique can still be used, you can't do anything crazy like modifying your whole party at once and not in all the properties of the whole party at once. Now, if you wanna try them out, I've included a link to all the GameShark codes below. If you try them out and notice anything new or have any insights into what could be causing this race condition, let me know in the comments. And I think that basically wraps it up. I had a lot of fun working on this video since I got to do some more things with electronics which has been an obsession of mine recently and I would love to continue doing it. So let me know if you liked it. In particular, I'm pretty inspired by channels like Abe's Projects and Matt KC, which I would say outline the sort of content I'm looking to create on YouTube in the near future. Obviously, it'll be with my own twist since I'm not quite as interested in Lego Island as Matt and I don't have Abe's art skills. But yeah, I'll be making more stuff for sure, especially involving the Game Boy or other embedded systems. So if you're interested in seeing that, make sure to subscribe and I imagine the next video will be out within a month. 
Thanks for watching. Green drink.